Hi, welcome back to Advanced Software Engineering. Today we will talk about safety engineering. So some of the software systems that we use in our daily lives are not that safety relevant. If you play a new game on your phone, that game crashes, big deal. Um, maybe it's going to crash just in time for you to look up and not walk into a lamppost. So that would be that would be good. That's kind of safety relevant, but not because of the software. There are a lot of software systems, though, that are really safety relevant. Airplanes. You don't want to sit in the one that fell off the sky because the software engineer didn't do a very good job of thinking it through. Um, we have a lot of software in cars. We have a lot of software in healthcare. Um, in energy plans, all sorts of things. And uh, if something goes wrong with those systems, that could harm human life, it could kill people, it could kill other forms of life, it could have negative environmental impact, different versions of things going wrong. So with safety engineering, we try to avoid all of these, which means that once we have an idea of what the system is that we're developing, we need to think about all the things that could potentially go wrong. And that is cost and time intensive. So if your system is not safety relevant, you're usually not going to put much time into that. Or that's not to say you're not going to put much time into making sure that the quality of your system is high. But specifically safety engineering for safety critical purposes is something that needs a lot of uh, dedicated attention and therefore incurs a lot of cost over time. But for the safety critical systems, like cars, airplanes, manufacturing plants, we want to make sure we think through that. And what the terminology is for safety engineering is we want to avoid accidents. So things go wrong when somebody or something got harmed. That's what we call an accident. And the cause of an accident is, call, is called a hazard. Hazard leads to accident. So with safety engineering, that's what we want to try to avoid. We avoid that by safety engineering and more specifically by safety cases, by developing safety cases. Now a safety case is a constructed argument that shows nothing is going to go wrong with the system because we catch all the eventualities. Oh, there's an R missing argument. So what we have to start with is identifying those potential hazards. Let's say we have a pretty simple system um, that gives us a medication. So for that medication system, we want to make sure that we identify all the potential ways where something could go wrong. Maybe the reminder functionality is broken. How could we ensure that? Is that a hardware thing? Because a hardware, um, a hardware sensor checks, I don't know, the sunlight of the sun coming up in the morning. This is a very unlikely software system. It's usually going to be buried somewhere in the software. Um, how are we going to calculate the dosage of the medication? Um, how, uh, how are we going to make sure the system gets back up properly if we have a power outage? and the system has to reset. How does it know whether the time of the day is before or after medication was administered? So all of these things, we get a list for each of the hazards that could happen. Example, power outage. Example, algorithm error. Example, sensor failure. For all of these, 
we gotta understand how likely is this gonna happen. So what's the probability of each of those? If each of those does happen, what's the severity? So how bad is the impact going to be if it does happen? And then from that, we derive what is the estimated risk? Which means if you have a high probability and a high severity, then your estimated risk is very high. But if you have a low probability and the severity is high, then you have an estimated risk of medium. Or if you have a high probability, but the severity is rather low, then you also have a medium risk. And if both are low, then you will have a low estimated risk. And from that, you conclude what's the acceptability of this happening. So both of those lead to this. And the estimated risk is going to lead us to the acceptability. This is a decision that has to be taken by management. So the analysis part is identifying the hazards, coming up with probability and severity, and then the estimated risk for that. And then you go to management and you tell them, these are our estimated risks for these identified hazards. Which of those would you rate how acceptable? And maybe management has delegated that to a safety engineer, because that's what we're schooling them for. Now, let's assume um, that those are the three potential hazards that we have to deal with. Now we've got to understand what can we do against each of them. If we say that each of them is likely enough to occur that we have to work with them, then let's think about how we can make sure that those are not going to trouble us. So for power outage, we can have a backup. I'm going to add this in a different color because it's not about the probability. So for power outage, what we can do is have a backup energy, energy source. For algorithmic errors that can occur, what can we do for that? Think back to the reliability chapter. We can calculate whichever algorithm that is in two separate ways. We can calculate it redundantly, but using diversity. So that means we want to try and get to the very same thing by two different ways. redundant calculation using um, I am completely blanking out on the term that I just said about 30 seconds ago using a diverse other version of it <laughs> using diversity let's go that way okay and then for the sensor failure, the only thing we can make sure that that doesn't occur is if we have an estimated lifespan of the sensor. And then we replace them frequently. And on top of that, we'll have a backup that's running as well. So we can have backup as well as regular replacement. And now the safety case that I talked about at the beginning, that's what we will use these strategies for. So our safety case says we're going to assume that our medication system is going to administer the wrong dosage or at the wrong time. And then we show that it's impossible to do that. So we will say that medication system did not administer because power outage. And then we show, oh, wait, but we have a backup energy source, so that's not going to happen. Or we assume, hmm, the algorithm had an error and we're going to administer the wrong dose. But wait, we did have a second implementation 
that calculated the medication differently. So that's not going to happen either. And then we're going to assume one of the sensors is going to fail and therefore they're going to administer the medication when inappropriate. But wait, that's not going to happen either because we replace them regularly and we have a backup sensor that's going to make sure that the value that we're um, inputting into the system is correct. So we almost have to go backwards. We assume that things are going to go wrong and then we're going to prove that they won't go wrong. And that's what we call a safety case. And if you can construct a safety case for all the hazards that can be identified for the system that you're working with, then you're safe. What's the consequence of that? Big specifications. So your safety cases, because they have to include so many probabilities and so many things that could potentially go wrong at some point during the lifetime of the system, that is a lot of work. And that's exactly why I said at the beginning, this is a rather costly activity and it takes a lot of time to do this properly. So if you want to think through that for a system of your choice, try to come up with just a few hazards and then write down this little safety case by saying, I'm going to assume this thing fails and then you show how it's not going to fail because you thought about it ahead of time and you engineered the safety into the system. And you'll be surprised at how many safety cases you, you end up uh, writing down for just a very simple system.